afternoon service after our big meal. So, <laughs> uh, nobody's saying much. <laughs> oh, I don't have any updates from our morning service. Does anybody have any updates on anything going on on that? Okay, if not, we'll turn it over to Ken for... Oh, you want opening prayer? Okay. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this day that you've given us and the many blessings in it. Thank you, Lord, for the, the rain you sent. And, and uh, ask that you be with us today as we go into this lesson. Be of Adam, help him have a good recollection of, of what he studied and help us be attentive and uh, apply it to our lives. And we thank you, Father, for the good meal we've had today and for the fellowship we can have as brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's Christ's name I pray. Amen. Two hundred. <clears throat> Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name, all his angels. Highest, all his angels praise proclaim, all his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, all ye have love heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. Far above the earth and sky, let them praise us, give Jehovah. They were made at his command, then forever he established, his decree shall ever stand. Praise the earth, O oh, praise Jehovah, all ye flawed, ye dragons all, fire and hell and snow and vapors, winds that hear him call. Let them pray, <coughs> to skip Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his throne is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, praise Jehovah in the cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people. Princes, great earth judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise us, give Jehovah. 
for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. <clears throat> Before the lesson, number 501. 501. Worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can resign? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It seems from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the hand, our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. Song of Encouragement. I'll try to get it right this morning, this evening. We'll sing 255 for the invitation song. And by the way, that wasn't Cody's fault, it was mine. I looked at the wrong side of the paper this morning. <laughs> Good afternoon. Get your Bibles with you. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is where we're going to start this afternoon. Boy, it's always hard to preach after having such a good meal. All the energy, all the blood is flowing right here and not right here. So just understand that this evening. But thank you everyone who brought a dish or helped set up or clean up. Um, wonderful times of fellowship to get to know each other more and to be involved in each other's lives. So thank you for uh, joining in on that um, this uh, uh, for lunch today. Christians are judgmental. At least that's what the majority of people say. See, in 2008, Barna Group did a survey asking this question. Do Christian churches accept and love people unconditionally regardless of how people look or what they do. So the question is, do churches accept people and love them? Now, those who said yes were about 47% of born-again Christians. 47% said yes. So the majority, 53% of people who were committed to the church, said no, churches are not loving and accepting. When it came to Christian church goers, this is a, a larger group, they asked them that same question. Only 41% said yes. And then when it came to outsiders, this is of all ages, only 20% said that churches are places of love and acceptance. And when they parsed it out even further, the, the younger the person was, the less likely they were to believe that the church was a place of love and acceptance. Now remember, this is a survey from 2008. This is 14 years ago, and I would imagine that in our time it's even lower. 
So often people inside and outside of the church perceive the church as prideful, judgmental, and quick to find the faults in other people. But that is not the way of Jesus. Read with me there in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world or to judge the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Here it says that Jesus came. His purpose of coming is that all, all might be saved through him. He didn't come to condemn you. He didn't come to judge you. Instead, he came, he came to save you. By dying on the cross for our sins, that's why he lived, that's why he died. He came to bring salvation to us. He didn't come to look down on us in our sin. He didn't come to condemn us. In fact, without Jesus coming to this earth, we already stood condemned. No, Jesus came to give the world salvation. That was his purpose. Not to judge, but to save. And that must be our purpose as well in our daily lives. Now you might say, hey Adam, hold on just a second. Jesus spoke about sin. Jesus spoke about hell. Jesus, in our world, might be viewed as judgmental today. And I believe that that is all true. When Jesus told the adulterous woman there in John chapter 8 to go and sin no more, she could have well said to him, she could have said if she lived in our day and time, don't judge me. I'm going to live however it makes me happy. Now, Jesus said there in, in verse 11 of that chapter, he says, neither do I condemn you. He was not willing to condemn the, the woman there. However, he still called her to repentance. He still called her to change her life, not to live in infidelity anymore, to live for God. I think it's important for us to note that no matter how many times we want to encourage people to live right for God, no matter, no matter how much we try to, to teach them what God has to say for their lives, there's always going to be some people that are going to view us as judgmental. No matter how kind and loving and compassionate we are, there are going to be people that are going to look at our message and say, we are judgmental, that we are judging them. And they'll probably say, mind your own business. However, even though that is a fact, we still have to preach the truth. Jesus addresses this in John chapter 9 and verse 39 where he says, For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Now if you look at that verse and then you compare it to John 3, 16 and 17, you might think, well that sounds a little bit contradictory. Jesus says, I didn't come to judge but to save. And then later on in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I came to judge. Which is it, Jesus? Well, neither Jesus nor John, who recorded this in his book, neither of them saw this as contradictory. So what is Jesus saying? I believe what Jesus is saying is that his intention, his purpose for coming to this earth, always was to bring salvation. That was his intent. However, the net result of Jesus' message sometimes will divide those who can see spiritually and those who can't see spiritually. Those who have a right heart towards God and those who have a hard heart towards God. Yes, he intended to bring salvation, but sometimes, based upon his, his statements, people are going to be judged, whether they are righteous or they're not. In a similar way, when I came to this congregation, that was my goal. My goal was to come and bring salvation. And all the sermons that I, I teach, that is the intention, is for me to help you become saved or to keep you saved. That is the purpose of my preaching. Yet the net result, sometimes based upon people's heart, might be kind of a, a deciphering between the two, between the sheep and the goat, between the righteous and the unrighteous. So sometimes the good news that I preach, even though it's my intention to bring salvation, it might reveal something deep within us that judges us 
and turns us in a, in a negative uh, relationship with God because of our own choice. I believe that's how Jesus can be both the Savior and the judge. He, he had the same message and same ministry to bring salvation, but sometimes it's divided people based upon the condition of their heart. And so by looking at how Jesus did it, how he intended to come to save, yet he still spoke the truth, I think we see in our life how we are to act, how we are to live if we're going to follow the example of Jesus. And I believe if we follow the example of Jesus, we first of all have to realize that it's our job to have a heart for souls. It's our job to have a heart for souls. It's our job, no matter what we preach, no matter what we teach, no matter what we tell to our neighbor, it should be always our intention to bring about their salvation. All that we say, all that we do, do all to the glory of God, right? We are to be people who are constantly trying to bring people into the fold of God, to bring them into a saving relationship with, with Jesus. That should be our intention. But sometimes for us as Christians, we don't always live that out. Sometimes we can be very judgmental. We can lash out at people, sometimes because we're, we're insecure in ourselves. You know, it's a lot easier to feel secure about yourself when you look down on other people. Sometimes it's because we, we are much more comfortable pointing out other people's sins than our own sins. Yes, we might condemn people who have alternative lifestyles, but we bar- barely consider, rarely consider our own pride, our own apathy, our own selfishness, our own materialism. Sometimes we lash out at others because we just have plain hate and bitterness in our hearts rather than love. That is not the way of Christ. Christ came as a humble man. He came as a compassionate and loving. He welcomed sinners to come and commune with them. Even these people who, who were viewed as outcasts in society, who were viewed as extra big sinners, Jesus embraced them because his purpose was to save, not condemn to lift people up, not tear them down, to bring them closer to God, not push them further away. So first, our job is to have a heart for souls like Jesus. But second, our job is to teach the truth. We have to teach the truth like Jesus and to do it from a heart of love. Yes, we have to understand that that not everyone will accept the gospel truth. There are going to be things that we teach that people are going to get offended by. And when we teach that salvation is only in Jesus, there are going to be people who are offended by that because they would say, well, you're being intolerant to these other religions. You might teach them about baptism, how you must believe and be baptized in order to be saved, Mark 16 and verse 16. And people might get offended because, because they haven't been baptized or maybe their relatives who have already passed away weren't baptized. Or you you might tell them, this is what it takes to live a holy life before God. And you might teach them the the ethics of our life, especially, and I think this is probably the most controversial in our our day and time, the sexual ethics that are required when it comes to following God. And people will look at that and and they will say, you're just just looking down your nose on me. You're You're just being extremely judgmental. Let me live however I want to live. There's a myriad of things that, that we teach that people will, will reject. The net result will be it will, it will judge between us and them, the righteous and the unrighteous. But even when other people are offended, even when people might think we're judgmental, we still need to teach the truth. And we do it with love. We do it with compassion. We do it for the intent of bringing them closer to God. But we still have to to preach the truth, even if it's viewed as intolerant. We can't avoid hard topics just because the world might view us as judgmental. We've got to preach the truth. That's our job. Preach the truth out of love for other people. See, it's other people's job. It's other people's job to react and respond appropriately to the good news. On the judgment day, it's God's job to judge the world of its sin. But right now, our job is to have a heart for souls. Our job is to share the good news with a loving heart. And in essence, really what we need to do is we need to show people
that we are for them, not against them. That we want the best for them, not just now, but for eternity. That we care about them so very much, no matter what they've done in the past, no matter what sin they are still doing, we embrace them, we care for them, we root for them. Because that's exactly what Jesus would do for them as well. So have a heart, have a heart for souls. Have that intention of bringing people closer to God and bringing them into a saving relationship with Jesus. And second, have a heart of love that teaches the truth, to show people the errors of their way with meekness, with compassion, yes. But still, we need to preach the truth even if we might be viewed as intolerant. So this week, as you go about your daily life, as you go to school, you go to work, show people that you are for them and not against them. Show them that you love them unconditionally. Show them that you have compassion in in your heart towards them. Help them in the needs that they have, but constantly be pointing them to Jesus. Point them to the truth, even if it might make them feel uncomfortable. Point them to it, because that will save their souls. Let's pray together as we think about this lesson. Dear God, our Father, we're thankful for the example of Jesus who had such a heart for souls, so much so that he came and he died for our sins. That he was willing to to give up all the glories of heaven to come to this earth and live as a human, to live as a servant and to die for our sins. We're, We're so thankful, Lord, for his heart for souls. And we're so thankful, Lord, that he accepted the people who were considered unacceptable. That he welcomed people in and he showed them that he loved them and cared for them. At the same time, we're also thankful that he called those people to repentance. He showed them the way of God. He showed them how they should live a life that's acceptable to God. And we see, so we see the example of Jesus this afternoon. I pray, Lord, that you will give us the strength to do that in our own lives. That you will help us always to have a heart for souls. That you will help us always to have a heart of love that will teach the truth to other people. That's our job, and Lord, we give the rest of that to you. And trust that you will work through our our imperfect actions, to show the world that we love them and to show them that you love them as well. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you need to respond to the amazing love of Jesus? For God so loved the world, he sent his only son for you and for me. Now it's our chance to respond to that. And for us as Christians, it's our our. Um, job to always respond to, to that loving action by having that loving action in our own lives to teach the truth and to welcome everyone into fellowship with God. Maybe there's someone this evening that needs prayers. Maybe you need to come to Christ for the first time. We'd love to help you. If you have any need, please come forward as we stand and sing this invitation song.
pray together. Holy and righteous Father who art in heaven, again we approach your throne of grace. Thank you so much for the wonderful day that you give us. Thank you for the rain that fell, Father, that uh, nurses the ground. Continue, Father, be with us now as we as we leave here in a little while and go our separate ways. We pray especially for the sick that was unable to be with us today. We pray that in some way or another, Father, that you'll give them the comfort and the health that they need to be back on their feet again, Lord, and be back again with us. Father, we're especially mindful of, of the uh, of the things that we need to do, Father. We pray that each one of us can do the, to do the work that you have set out for each one of us to do, Lord, and we pray that we can always uh, do it in a manner that will be pleasing to thee. We pray, Father, as we have gathered here today, we pray that it would be acceptable in your sight. Be with us always, Lord. These things we ask in your Son's holy name. Amen.